which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which there were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Oh, there you are. Here I am. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. I was enjoying that. You could have kept going. <laughs> <laughs> it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more? Mm -hmm. Shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant. And those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Mm -hmm. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. <laughs> Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. When Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered in the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer more often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Amen. Thank you for letting me read that. No, I no, I, I love that part. That's that's a beautiful one, and, and <clears throat> one thing that kind of sneaks in there, uh, a little word that just sneaks by, you don't really see it, uh, because they, they talk about it a little more in detail um, a few verses on, but it says that, that it's a means of death. And later on it talks about um, that, that death is necessary and Christ died for all, which is true, absolutely true. We're, we're not, we're not um, arguing that, and that usually becomes a, you know, a big shining focus of this passage is that Christ died once for all. But if you remember that what's bringing us to the gospel is the idea that every man will die for his own sin. The wages of sin is death. What can we bring that will repay the Lord? We have nothing that we can recompense the Lord with. 
but we know the wages of sin is death. Now there is, as it puts it out straightforward, a means of death, which is acceptable to the Lord God. And that's mm -hmm. Christ Jesus. So it ties us in, not that we've done anything, but we're eagerly wanting that means of death so that we might die to sin. And this passage shows exactly not just how that happens, but that that's actually acceptable. This is part of the process. This is a legal death payment as far as, as the father is concerned. And that's a beautiful well, thing. Since we're on the topic, let me pick your brain because I'm, I'm teaching this on Wednesday nights in our church. Okay. To me, this, this uh, chapter nine is like the pinnacle. It's, it's like this is, the, this is the apex, the pinnacle of the, the letter. This is where it all kind of comes together. Okay. Um, well, but let me ask you this question then. What was the purpose of the blood of the bulls and the goats? Well, the, well <clears throat> we know in a general sense, because it tells us this, um, <clears throat> that all of these things are a type or a shadow or a sacrifice, but as, as, as you've read, um, the reality is Christ. And I think Paul's got another passage in, in Colossians. Anyway, there's, there's one where, where Paul basically reiterates in a very brief way that, um, that Christ is performing this. Um, and then we find out later when Christ is fulfilling his great high priest role that this is what it's for. Um, so, so from that, we can take, for example... Uh, that one of the purposes of, of the sacrifice of the bulls and the goats, for instance, would be to impress upon the people the futility of ritual, that we have to do this every single time. Um, mm. So that's one thought. Another thought, and this is, this is a common theme, is, um, is that sacrifice should come at a cost it wasn't just that the priests had a herd somewhere and they just, you know, dragged up a couple. No, you're supposed to bring your bull. You're supposed to bring your yearling lamb. You're supposed to bring your two goats or whatever the, the case may be um, as required. So this comes at a cost. And if, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're a young Israelite just trying to get off the ground and you've got three cows and now all of a sudden, you know, another year comes around and you've got to drag another one of these cows up, and maybe God didn't bless you with, with, you know, a cow this year. Maybe you don't have a new baby cow. <laughs> or maybe you do have a baby cow, but that's what God's requiring. It's a one-year cow. Well, what do they call it a sacrifice, right, Brother Jim? I mean, sacrifice means you, you have to give up. Correct. And so one of the, one of the effects of this, um, as well as just the tedium of doing it year in and year out, is it's really going to weed out the non-hackers in a way. If you're not serious about this, you're going to get angry about this really quick. If you don't believe in God, if you believe this is all hokum, if you thought we were probably better off in Egypt, and there was a lot of that complaining that had been going on. Um, and even then, they, they really didn't know what they were getting into. And we've talked about that, where uh, they hear God speaking and rumbling from the top of Mount Sinai, and they go to Moses, and they're like, look, this is your guy. You go talk to him and tell us what we got to do. We don't want to deal with this guy. You go deal with this guy. And then Moses comes down and says, here's how this is going to play. And they're like, okay, whatever. But, you know, do they have buy-in, as we would say? Um, probably not so much, you know? And that's, that's, we see that throughout, you know, Kings and Chronicles and, and all of this, uh, that just human nature is that... You know, when things go your way, you're kind of like, okay, but when it, when it comes at a cost to you, now it's your bowl, or, you know, everybody's got to go to Jerusalem because it's Passover, or whatever the case may be. Um, when those things come at a cost, um, it, it, it brings us to an accounting, I guess would be a good way of saying it. Um, it, it makes us really question, are, are we doing this? And, and I honestly believe, and, and We've talked this one before, too, that people who are on uh, uh, what we call the works treadmill uh, in, in Protestant church culture, uh, eventually you're going to hit this. It's going to be such a pain. It's going to be such a drag. It's going to come at such a cost that at some point in the game, if you're just playing, if you're a hypocrite, you're going to stay up one of these nights and say to yourself, this ain't worth it to me. I'm getting nothing out of this. And I don't mean that in a, in a 
transactional sense that someone's expecting, but in truth, that's really what the works treadmill is. I'll do this, God's going to do this. But in every single case, you're going to find that the people uh, just fall to their knees under the burden. It's too costly. It's too time consuming. It's not the desire of their heart uh, when it really comes down to it. It might be the desire of their heart to be right in the sight of God, but if in, instead of, of looking into it or considering it or praying about it or, or a number of other things, uh, we get told that we're supposed to do X, Y, and Z, and then we do. And our souls are unconverted. Our minds are not transformed. We're still on the works. We're still feeling the weight of sin because we don't believe that we've been forgiven because we've still got more work to do. And eventually we either give up out of despair or we admit that we're being hypocrites and, and we bail on it. Or yeah. Lord willing, you know, the, God brings us across passages like in Galatians where it's, uh, grace is, you know, free. And, and all of a sudden he opens up our mind and, and you know, <coughs> excuse me, we understand that offering. So I think those could be a couple of good reasons that the sacrifices were instituted. Yeah, and it's kind of ironic, too, because, I mean, I was reading from Hebrews chapter 9, and the writer of Hebrews is writing to the Jewish people. He's mm -hmm. writing to the, 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 the Jewish church um, uh, specifically. I mean, you know, I mean, it it's, applies to everyone. Right. Reads it, but, I mean, specifically writing to the Hebrew uh, and, and by reading through the, the book, I think it's, to me, it's very evident that he's writing to those that were saved and knew they were saved and to some that were not saved but didn't know that they were not saved and needed to be educated and informed that their works, the old way was no longer, in, uh, it did no longer apply. The, the old was, well, like you said, it was a shadow, it was a type that mm -hmm. went into the new. And that's why I think chapter nine, to, it's like, it's like, you know, he's building, he's building blocks. He's building yes. blocks. He's taking, he's taking you through this, you know, to bring you to the point where you see that, okay, now you see that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, came to fulfill and, 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 and culminate and perfect and be greater than all of those old rituals and covenants and, and things that were before. And it's like, hopefully at this point, the light just like with anyone who's reading, it just like went on like, oh, hallelujah, you know, like, or, or it, now, you know, it could be, or maybe also, um, if we consider, you know, there, there are some who think Paul wrote it, but it wasn't signed. There are some who think Barnabas wrote it, but it's clear that whoever wrote this is very familiar with, with Jewish culture and temple law and, and how sacrifices and things were done in the first century. And sure. the presumption is also that they're writing to Jews in Jerusalem. Yes. Now, now we know that there was a big, heavy uh, sort of cultural hand or expectation on how Jews related to other Jews in and around Jerusalem. And we see that, uh, for example, when, um, when Peter had met with the Jews and then, and then um, no, I'm sorry, when James was, was meeting with, with the Jews and then Paul shows up and says, you know, you eat with the Jews, but your Gentile brothers and sisters are over here at the back table. This ain't right. Um, I, think you, I think you were right the first time. I think oh, was it, was it Peter? Peter? Okay, yeah, I, I always mix them up. Um, but yeah, we, so we know, well, we know in general that, that Jewish cultural life was very, uh, I won't say isolated or insulated, but it had certain things that only Jews did that were that set them apart from the cultures of the day and did so for thousands of years we've talked earlier well, yeah they, i mean Jew, they, they were jews were the chosen people yes you know I mean, the gentiles were the dogs right like you know i mean god had to literally give uh, peter a vision of eating uh, unclean right. animals exactly say, and right? and so you could also look at this passage in hebrews some somewhat um, maybe in a secondary vein, along those same lines. You've got a bunch of Jews who have been raised their entire life that uh, you're a Jew because you've been circumcised or you uh, don't eat meat or, or wh whatever the particular rules or regulations are. You give 
well, you know, the rich young ruler, oh, I give a tenth of my mint and cumin and dill and all of this kind of stuff. All of these things, all of these actions that or genealogy, or just the fact that you could trace your roots back to, to Abraham. Right, right. Um, and so you've got that in play, and what what the writer in Hebrews is laying out straight flat out in chapter nine is you're you're catching a lot of flack, or maybe you're not catching a lot of flack because you're still going to temple, you're still doing your sacrifices, you're still doing all of the things that made you a Jew trying to perform the righteousness that God requires. But if you understand that Christ has fulfilled the righteousness that God requires, and I would assume they have, um, I'm sure this is the doctrine that had probably been, you know, espoused at that church and laid out in detail, because by now we're probably 20, 30 years after the death of Christ when this letter is written. Um, Nobody's going to sit there and say, oh, I don't get the idea of Christ as the great high priest who has brought the sacrifice once for all. So, yeah, there may be some people who read this and go, ah, ah, the, the high priest, yes, okay. But there are probably also some people that are like, well, does this mean I'm not supposed to go to the temple on Sunday? And, yeah, you're supposed to separate from that sort of culture. I'm not saying that that we're supposed to uh, abandon, but but to go there and and perform rituals in the interests of of shining on the people that were around to make our life easier. Uh, I I kind of have a a little feeling that that's sort of where this is also digging at there, you know, that uh, that we're called to stand out more. Um, how else can we preach Christ? as the satisfaction for God's, uh, God's requirements against sin, if we're still at the, the synagogue, bringing our pigeons. Yeah. You know, you know I always found it, you, you brought it up. I always found it interesting that Paul, um, it says he withstood or rebuked Peter to his face. Yes. It, 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 in front of everybody, like this was a public rebuke that he did, and and um, I always thought about this because, you know, we see this in Christian circles as well as anywhere else in the world. This idea that who are you right. to tell me? Now I can imagine, like you know, the Bible doesn't reveal it at all, but if I could read minds through the the pages of scripture, Peter must have been thinking like, Paul, who do you think you are? I'm Peter. <laughs> I'm the one that the, the, the Lord Jesus said, I'm going to build this church upon you, the rock. I'm changing your name to the rock. And, you know, and even though when I messed up, he like, you know, he restored me and he gave, commissioned me to go and be. And Paul said, he rebuked him to his face, you know, because he was bringing he was bringing old into the new. Right. He was bringing old covenant rituals and traditions into the new covenant. And it's like, you can't do that, right. Brother Peter. You can't do that. Right. He, now, Peter could turn around and said, well, who are you, Paul? You were killing us a few years ago. Right. But he here's, going, here's the other thing. So yeah. Peter is just a Galilean uh, fisherman, you know. Now, consider Paul because nobody really thinks about Paul, right? Saul of Tarsus, he's not from Jerusalem, but his parents are citizens. They bought their citizenship in Rome, which means right. Paul was born, a Jew was born a free man in the Roman Empire. Now, his, talk about the sovereignty of God, right? Right. How that worked out for him in his life, right? Exactly. And, and, I don't know if know, that's what you're going with, but it's what it made me think of. It's, it's one of them. But I, I, want to, I want people to understand, really, uh, I look at Paul as sort of the Danny DeVito of the first century. I really, really do. Uh, he was so annoying that eight years in, they're, they're like, you need to go over here for a while. And they kept him you know, exiled for eight years, building churches in Asia, because he was just causing such a stir, because everybody was still freaking out about, you know, how can Saul be a Christian? And this instance with, with Peter happened before this eight-year disappearance act kind of happened. 
But consider Saul was a, a free citizen. His parents had enough money to basically get him in at the temple in Jerusalem. And not only get him in at the temple in Jerusalem, but they apparently had enough scratch to get him under the knee of Gamaliel, who apparently, uh, from what we read in there, uh, he was the student's student. He was the teacher's pet. We don't know how accurate that may be. But certainly, nobody is going to sit there and argue that Paul does not know the scriptures and how they relate to Jews. In fact, he was so zealous about it, as you point out, that it, he considered it a service to God to be killing Christians because they were in opposition to God's people. So when a fisherman who has failed Christ three times on, on the night of the crucifixion gets brought up by a guy who used to murder Christians and then calls Peter out and says, you're doing wrong by trying to follow these laws. And let me tell you, if anybody knows these laws, it's me. Peter is not going to say, who are you, Paul, to speak thus to me? Neither are most of the Jews around there. You know, they might look at Paul as this, you know, shrinky dink annoying guy that they want to leave the party as soon as he shows up at the door kind of thing. But you can't argue that he, he doesn't know the scripture and he doesn't apply it correctly or that he wasn't trained correctly or that he didn't understand things like global politics. He's kind of, he was the nerdy immigrant kid. You know what I mean? And, uh, yeah. and so, yeah, for him to come into the room, especially after Peter had had that rooftop experience and to call Peter out on that, I would be, I would, the one thing we don't know is whether or not Paul was aware of Peter's rooftop experience by this point in the game. Because I always found it interesting that Peter in the rooftop experience was basically given the, the task to preach the gospel to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. But right. it ended up falling to Paul to do the heavy lifting and go around to where the Gentiles were while Peter's kind of just hanging out with the crowd in Jerusalem. And, yeah, and Paul always, Paul always made it clear his heart was for his kinsmen. Yeah. His brethren, his brethren after his own kind. Uh, was it Romans 9? He says, I, I wish I could become a curse for, yes. for the fellow Jews. So he always had a had a passion and a desire to go and preach the gospel to his his fellow Jewish brethren, but uh, he knew that his commission was to the Gentiles. You know, yeah. And you know, I just, I just, yeah, I gotta just say here, I love Peter. I mean, I love Peter because I'm I'm kind of like Peter. I'm actually I'm a lot like Peter. <laughs> uh, you know, no matter no matter how much the Lord shows and reveals to me. On occasion, I do the thing that he does, which is like just take my foot and just stick it right in my mouth. <laughs> right. You know? and, uh, and sometimes I need to be rebuked, just like uh, Paul did to Peter. Uh, I, I need that on occasion because I think my sometimes my zealousness uh, runs ahead of the Spirit of God and sure. my the knowledge that God has given me through his word and through the Holy Spirit. Uh, it just happens. I, I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, it's just every once in a while, I'm like, I find myself being like, oh, you're right. You're right. I, I, just, I, don't, I need to repent of that. It, it just happened recently. So um, I can definitely identify with it. And, and you know what? You know, I don't, I, you know, I don't look at it as good or bad. I just look at it as like Peter was Peter. Paul was Paul. They're totally different personalities and individuals. I'm both called by God, both you know, commissioned by God to do the work they were needed to do. I And I actually kind of like that. Here comes Paul, who was a Pharisee, who was trying to arrest and persecute and kill Christians. He right. comes along and like, God's like, no, 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 I got a whole new plan for you. And actually uses him to rebuke, like, I mean, you could see. The head of the church. Know. Yeah. Well, there were Peter, James, and John. Those are the three. Those are the three that we find out were Jesus' closest disciples, Peter, James, and John. And Peter's the most mentioned apostle in the scriptures. And he used Paul to rebuke Peter to his face in front of everybody to, to, to say, look, you, you, you're doing it again, Peter. Yeah. You're doing it again. You're getting off track. You're, getting, you're letting whatever, whatever's going on, you're letting it affect. And, and even to the point of hindering the gospel, you know? Yeah, yeah. He, so, and we spoke about this. I don't remember if it was last week or week before um, about Paul almost gets 
you know, violently angry at the idea that someone's going to tack on a Jesus plus kind of mentality when the gospel is free. Um, and we brought up Galatians, you foolish Galatians, you know, having, having who bewitched this, you, who, who has ensorcelled you, who has, who has snared your mind? Yeah. I never did look up that word to see if it actually meant a rabbit snare, but, uh, um, but yeah, Paul, Paul gets angry and, uh, yeah. and it makes me wonder that, um, you know, maybe Paul's got a little bit of arrogance as well because uh, consider his upbringing, consider where he's from. He's probably not made a whole lot of friends anyway, uh, but he's certainly learned in, in the law and he's learned in the scripture. You know, dude can put himself in front of Festus and make an argument. You know, it's yeah. like going in front of the Supreme Court. This, this guy's got some, some brain pan to rub together. So yeah. He's Here, I'll read it. Yeah, go for it. Galatians chapter 3. He says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. I love his, 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 his yeah, way of speaking. Just tell me this. <laughs> tell me one thing. That's right. <laughs> you know, tell me one thing. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are you now going to be made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And he goes on to, to, to reference Abraham. Yeah. But I, I, love, I love his way of speaking. He's just like, Really, I mean, let's let's just reason this out. Okay? Right. Really, like you 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 were saved by faith, by God's grace, and and now you're gonna like take over and you're gonna run things from here. Like, are you, you really gonna be that foolish? Yeah, and and I I'm not familiar enough to to lay it all out, but there were in 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 Greek culture and in Roman culture at the time. The idea of making an argument, of having a debate, um, was highly prized in the society. And there were, there were certain methods that are even continued today. If you go into a college or a high school and into a debate club, they have certain, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, certain ways to present an argument or defend an argument. Uh, you may have heard, for example, of the straw man argument. That's, that's yeah, that's a weak method of doing debate. But so... So this idea of, of being skilled at, at handing out an argument, um, one of the arguments that they developed was this, uh, this one um, ad absurdium, which be, means you take, you take the lesser and then you turn it into the most greatest ridiculous kind of thing. You know, um, I don't like clowns. Well, you must hate Ronald McDonald and not eat their food or something. Uh, it's the idea of mocking something in a discussion. And I think Paul's really using that here to sort of twist the knife. He's saying, I'm presenting you evidence that you yourself can't argue with. And the logical conclusion of that evidence would be the exact opposite of the actions you're taking right now. Why do I have to point this out to you that this is, like he says, foolish? That word carried yeah. weight. Remember, uh, even Jesus said, you know, he who calls his brother, you fool will be in danger of hellfire. Yeah. So here's Paul saying, you guys are idiots. <laughs> you know, he's bringing out a strong word with a strong yeah. argument because he's... Well, here's, here's, here's what he's referring to, and this is what we were talking about, Galatians 2, verse 11. Galatians 2, verse 11, he says, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Or before certain men come from James, that's where you, you get the mix. mix yeah, up it. it's true. And, yeah, <laughs> he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when they saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, that's the key right there. Right. They were not being straightforward about the truth of the gospel. I said to Peter, before them all, 
right? This was this was a public rebuke, right? Right. If you are a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no, no flesh shall be, be justified. Right. So he's like, he's saying, and then he goes on, he says, but if, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor, transgressor for I through the law, Die to the law that I might live to God. And I'll, I'll conclude with verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself. Amen. Yeah. That's kind of my motto uh, passage, Galatians 2.20. Yeah, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Um, and yeah, it's, it's absolutely true that, uh, that we need to act in an accordance with what we believe and, and, uh, and on the converse, how we act shows really what we believe, which is kind of back to the top of the, of the discussion we were having, you know, what was the purpose of the sacrifice? Well, do we really believe that God's impressed by bulls and goats? Do we really believe that we're getting a benefit or earning righteousness or whatever the case? And if the answer is, is no, um, then you're just, you're, you're wasting bulls and goats and your time. You know, I mean, I'm sure yeah. there were, I'm sure there were plenty of true believers in Israel that, that believed that these things were, were effective in, in the sight of God. And God said as much, you know, I'll, I'll accept this as your yearly annual sacrifice. Um, but I'm sure there were just as many people who were like, this is all hokum. You know, I, I, this isn't the God I heard about. He didn't need chickens and bulls and stuff like this, you know. And you'll hear the same thing today. God doesn't require that of people. Um, and that's, that's a difficult thing for Christians because, as we've said, um, we are no longer earning righteousness through works because Christ has performed that work. But we are called to holiness which is a right. different thing. Um, and in, in that perspective, you could look at it from the Old Testament view where people were trying to live holy lives in order to acquire righteousness. But in the Christian view, we are righteous. And so we continually conform, transform into living a more sanctified and holy life through the power of Christ, not through our own doing, but through the power of Christ. But why? Okay, so that, that's the, 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 the uh, got to put the line down now and say, why do Christians do that? If we're why? not doing it to earn God's favor or earn righteousness, why do we do it? I would, I would go at it from two different, two different places. One, the Spirit compels us to use the line from the exorcist. The Spirit of Christ compels you. Um, when you have an actual appreciation of the gospel, um, when you realize your sins are forgiven, all of them, my sins tomorrow, already dealt with. I don't know what they're going to be. Christ knows what they're going to be. Christ already dealt with that. If I truly believe that, um, and we've been using the example of the guy whose mortgage got paid by his enemy kind of thing. Um, eventually, you're either going to love your enemy uh, for what they've done, or you're going to desperately resent your enemy because now you have an obligation to them. The spirit in us, when we understand the transaction, that while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. The father said, hey, how about that one? And Christ said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that for him. You know, like it's, it's a common phrase, you know, if there were just one person that had to be saved, Christ still would have gone to the cross. Um, and and it's, it's a brutal thing. And we don't, we don't have obedience to a Christian lifestyle because we're necessarily obligated to Christ because he did this for us. Um, although that's, that's one way of, of 
looking at it to consider, but rather because the spirit is in us and we know that we have been forgiven. We know that we have a relationship with the father that is no longer debtor and servant, but rather father and I won't even say child. We are, we're in-laws now. We, we've been married into the family. And so when we, when we have that, then when God gives us, gives us an opportunity to do whatever it may be, you know, you find yourself in, in a position where someone has a need, and you have the ability to meet the need, you meet the need, and you say, God's blessings upon you, brother, or God's blessings mm -hmm. upon you, sister. Uh, right. The Spirit compels us. And, and that in itself is basically living the righteous, holy life. You're letting the Spirit guide you because God has, like it says, prepared these works beforehand since the foundation of the world that we might walk in them. Um, we don't know where we're going. We know that God's going to prep us for it. And when we get there, he's going to give us what we need, which we've said before. That's, that's part one. How and why do Christians live obedient lives of greater sanctification? Well, if we, if we, if we do the plan and we keep our eyes open and we see, oh, look, we're in another situation where God has enabled us to, to help or to, to uplift or to pray or whatever the, the, the work may be, um, then, then we step more and more closer into that same uh, conformity with the image of the Son, who, again, we were enemies. We weren't his friends. We didn't want him. And yet he stepped down and said, I'm going to do you a solid because my dad loves you. And you don't know what's coming, but I do. So, so yeah, I think the Spirit compels uh, obedience in, in Christians, and it's a joyful obedience. And honestly, we don't even know, like Christ says, my burden is easy. I got nothing that's going to weigh you down. It's, it's, it's a joy when you find yourself in a position of service like that to think that God laid all that stuff out and you just kind of stumbled into it. And you got to be the one that was there to see that, that happen. That's really exciting. That's really cool. Uh, at least to me, I find that really exciting. Um, Man. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and the other is, um, again, the, the conforming and transforming. Um, if you are, are, and we've spoken on this too, if, if you are a Christian and you are continually, um, or at least with some regularity, hearing the word or reading the word or contemplating the word, uh, or reading a devotional or whatever the case may be, you're going to find that you are more aware of your sin than you were when you were first saved. You are sure. more aware because you become more aware, uh, not just of the various and sundry things that, that are outlined as offenses in God's sight throughout the scriptures, but also because as Christians, we, we begin to see the character of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, we, and we begin to realize how, how little we had, we had nothing to claim on this. Uh, you go all the way back to, you know, to Isaiah, I will call a people my people who are not my people, and they will say of me, you are my God. And again, the passage where it says of the Messiah, it is too small a thing for you to be the Savior of my people Israel. Therefore, I will send you to the Gentiles that you may be a light to the whole world. When we realize that the adoption isn't just, you know, they, they put us in the broom closet and we're Harry Potter kind of thing. But no, man, they, they, they gussied us up and they married us to the prince. You know, the father decided we were good enough to marry his son, his only son, and get everything that he had laid out for his son. And we aren't even his people. You know, contrast that with Samson and Delilah, where Samson, you know, met this, uh, met this hot foreign girl down at the bottom of the hill, and he thinks she's all this and that and the other, and he begs his, begs his parents, let me marry her, marry her marry her and they're like you, you can't do that you don't marry outside of the tribe and god in our case said yeah that's exactly what's going to happen we're going to pull in the people who aren't the tribe i'm going to show you just how wide this tribe is going to stretch and when we have that understanding um of it it, it demolishes 
in a Christian or should demolish in a Christian any thought of deservedness. It right. goes even further um, in, in mortifying that transactional mindset that we've spoken of before. Um, yeah. and, we, and we realize that it's, it's a gift. And the more we learn about the father, the more we learn about the son, even the more we learn about marriage customs in the first century, we just see all of these things come into play. And we're like, wow, how, how amazing it is that we were included in this. Consider that in the Bible, it actually says that the purpose of the saved isn't that we shine up great. It isn't that we're going to be billions and billions of people who are called up to heaven, like it says in, in uh, Revelations 4. What it is, and this is what the scripture says, it says, we were saved so that in the ages to come, the glory of the Father might be seen through us. Meaning that oh. what, what the Father did for us, other people, whomever, maybe angels, I don't know. Not going to jump anywhere near that. But, but people will see. The, the vast amounts of people that the Father saved through the sacrifice of Christ, and they're the people who witness that and understand that will give glory to the Father and say, mm. what an awesome God he is that he did that. So how can we do any less than continue to praise God and, and want to know him more when we Amen. gain greater understandings of what he has done to that degree for us? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Well said. Yeah, it's amazing. God's amazing grace. I mean, I, you know, I it's it's I look look back and I go, before I was saved, I didn't love God. I didn't love Christ. I, I actually hated God and hated Christ. Yeah. And and I, I mocked and ridiculed and made fun of people who did. Um and you know, and I look back and went, and then God saved me. And it, it, like, it's literally like, I mean, I get, I get born again. I mean, I get it, born again. Born yeah. again to me is like, I get it. You know, I mean, I was born again. Like a transformation happened. I became, I was one person. I became a new person. And and like, you know, my, I didn't lose my personality. I didn't lose my my gifts and desires and all the things I had before, but like my my love for God that 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 was new. That was like I went from not caring about God, not loving Him, not caring about His Son and what He did for me, and then it's like amazing. You know, yeah. it's, it's amazing grace. It really is amazing grace. And it's like when I met my wife, you know, and you know, and this love is poured into your heart to pour out to, to, to her. It's like that wasn't there before, but now it is. Right. You know, um, and, and you can't really compare the two, but um, it's just like you go, wow! Like this is this is supernatural. This is divine. What happens in our lives? And so, yeah, it's like that's why. That's why it's like, well, okay, what can I do for you, my love? When I'm speaking to my wife. Right. What can I do to bless your life? You know, I don't do it perfectly. And even with God, it's like, God, what can I do to, to bless you? My, my, my father, my, 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 you know, uh, bridegroom, uh, right. it, you know what I mean? I, I don't do it perfectly, but that's my desire now. Like right. he just changed my whole, my heart, my heart's desire. And, and so just, I praise God for that. Yeah. Um, and that's straight from heaven. I was reading something just today um, about a concept, and I, I think it came from, um, from Augustine, uh, where the greater displaces the lesser. So we had these lesser desires that drove us, a desire to have fun or party or, or um, go, you know, go to bars or drink or, or whatever. But then, but then, God drops this greater desire in us a love of him, a love of Christ, a love for our brothers and sisters that is greater than this lesser and it displaces the lesser to the point that we don't even consider 
the lesser anymore. This has our focus. It's easy enough to say that if you remove a temptation, um, whatever that temptation may be, that, uh, that you're not going to do it and your life has changed. Well, no, you've just removed a temptation, but that desire is still there. The miracle of the new birth is that God gives us these new, greater desires that utterly displace the other ones. We're not interested in being rock and roll stars or video stars or this or that or whatever the case may be, uh, because we have a greater love, we have a greater desire. We've been given new things to aspire to, you know, yeah. earnestly seek the greater goals, earnestly seek the greater gifts. And those are the ones we look at. We're like, yeah, I, I'd like to do that. I'd like to be that. Wouldn't that be neat? Instead of sitting right. there saying, wow, I wish I had a Lamborghini. I don't care about a Lamborghini. <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know? We've, and, and what's funny is that also teaches us, strangely enough, contentment, which is, uh, which is in, sometimes in short supply. Because when we realize that God has given us these desires and the means to, to meet them in us, um, then the physical things just don't matter anymore. Kind of like Christ when he's, when he's in Matthew and he says, your father knows you need these things. So don't, don't sit there and run around saying, how am I going to get dressed? What am I going to wear? You know, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? <laughs> what are you worried about? <laughs> you know? Yeah. God's got much bigger plans for that. He'll take care of the food, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and back to our original, if we believe that, we're going to walk that, we're going to talk that, and we're going to think that. And that takes practice. That takes, that takes some, some hard practice to do that. Because like, like you say, uh, you know, we're, we're not perfect. And it's real easy for us to, to get distracted or just get in a rut and we're doing our work thing. And then the next thing you know, uh, you know, two days have gone by. And we really haven't thought about, you know, are there brothers and sisters I could pray for? Is there, is, you know, did, did I walk by a situation where God was like, I gave you a tool to do something here today and you just blurped right by it, you know? Um, so we can, we can lose our distraction like that. But by and large, uh, that continuous transforming and sanctification into the image of the sun. Um, this, this is why I kind of like the idea uh, and we've talked about this, you know, did, did Christ know who the 12 apostles were going to be? You know, did the father say to him, you're going to meet Zechariah and you're going to meet, you know, Nathan and you're going to meet, or did he have to walk around and, you know, put out the call and then these guys show up and he's just as excited as they are, you know what I mean? To come across these situations. And so we should kind of have that, I'm not saying that's doctrine, but, you know, in a way, in that manner of thinking, we should be that excited to stumble across the things that God's laid in our path. You know, I'm not worried about what I'm going to eat tonight. God's got that taken care of, you know? Right. And if, if like Paul, I, I go hungry or I go naked or I'm beaten with rods, that's what God has for me today. Mm. You know, new manna tomorrow, new manna yeah. tomorrow, you know? Right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to read this one thing. Uh, this was actually posted by uh, Pastor William Poss from Redeemer Church in, in Florida, where, where Matt attends. He posted this on Facebook, and it's really lengthy. It's one of the, one of the Puritan writers. Um, but it, I love it when, when I come across something that's an exhortation, uh, that calls us, kind of like we're talking now, to, to a, a greater action. And so this one was, uh, was entitled, Do You Indeed Act As You Pray? And I'll just read little bits of it here. It says, our prayers are to act upon those ourselves. They have, or ought to have, great power in the formation of character and the regulation of conduct. It is plain, therefore, that much of prayer is mere words. We either do not understand or do not consider or do not mean what we say. Do we go from praying to acting, and to live for Jesus, for heaven, for eternity. How common is it for professors to pray for victory over the world, to be delivered from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, to be enabled to set their affections on things above and not on things of the earth, and to be dead 
to the scene and temporal things, and all the while, they are as obviously eager to amass wealth, to multiply the attractions of the earth, and to enjoy as much luxurious gratification as possible. And he ends at the end of this, he says, how often do we pray to be delivered from evil tempers and irascible feelings, and yet we indulge them on every slight provocation, and we take no pains to subdue them. It is unnecessary to multiply the illustrations of the inconsistency between our prayers and our practice. And mm -hmm. yeah, and so, yeah, when, when uh, Pastor Bill posted that one, I thought, wow, that's, that's, some, that's some chewy, strong meat right there. And it, it, yeah, it goes back to what we were talking before. What we believe shows what we act. If we're praying for a need to be met, um, like food, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Um, and I'm not saying that people aren't in situations where they're hungry, but uh, the more it seems that we're concerned with temporal matters and we find those as the focus of our prayers, it sort of shows that we haven't yet believed that God is going to be that provider, yeah. you know, that, that he's going to take care of us, even if we can't see it. And so that's, it's an opportunity for us to work our faith and get stronger. And it says we have to practice our faith. It doesn't come easy. It's not going to necessarily fall out of the sky. And, and all of a sudden we feel like practicing our faith. Practice means hard work and we do it every day. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so that one passage, I, I thought that was really good and timely and, uh, and useful. Um, and I'll post that when we post the video, I'll post the full thing down in the comments below, but I just wanted to bring that out. Um, so yeah, Christians, brothers and sisters, if you're out there and you're praying to the Lord, um, believe in whom you petition, believe mm. that he has good things for you and that there are more important things out there than, um, you know, a Cadillac or a new job or, or whatever the case may be. Um, he knows what he's doing in your life, even if we don't. So trust mm. in the Lord and pray that he would, he would bring you more confidence. And as we've said before, show us those opportunities where we can support one another in faith, our brothers and sisters. Um, Cause those are the time, those are the times that he uses to bolster our faith as well, even if we're down or depressed or, or concerned or worried. Uh, get together with your brothers and sisters and, and do what you can and, uh, and let the Lord work in your life. So anyway. Amen. Yeah. Good word, so, brother. Good word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's kind of what, what got me thinking this week. And uh, I hope everybody out there kind of thinks about that uh, as well. Um, what can we do? How can we, uh, how can we find more Christ in our life and then act upon that? Um, how do we appreciate him more? So yeah, find those things uh, like Brother Matt's been, been reading from Hebrews 9 at the start of this. Get yourself in Hebrews 9 and you'll see on a grand scale what, what Christ has done for us. And, uh, and that's a great motivator um, to start your day to realize that we have that great high priest in heaven. So, so yeah. Well, Brother Matt, you want to pray us out tonight? And uh, I would love to, brother. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time together, for opening up the Word and, and discussing the Word. And, and just, uh, as my brother said, chewing on the heavy meat sometimes. And, and, and just, you know, we're, we're no longer on the milk. We got to get, uh, got to get the meat so we can uh, grow in our faith and our, and our love for Christ. So thank you for my brother, Jim. May you continue to pour your uh, blessing and hand upon him as he goes through what he's going through right now with him and his family. Uh, I thank you for his willingness to, to do these uh, podcasts, and I just thank you for the privilege of uh, joining him on, on them and uh, just uh, reconnecting and, and, and sharing the, the, the same faith that we had uh, mm. all those years ago when he was sharing the gospel with me back in, uh, I don't know what it was, 1990. <laughs> I don't know what it was. But anyway, I thank you for that, Lord. And uh, may you continue to uh, uh, cause growth in our lives. And uh, may we know more and more of Christ, that we may live more and more for him and glorify his name in our lives. So we thank you, Lord. 
We ask your blessing upon uh, our night in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Lord, I just I I agree with my brother here, and I pray that uh, that you would you would lay a hand of understanding on uh, on the people in his Wednesday night study and on the Sunday morning services, Lord. Um, both at Redeemer and, and at Asheville Bible Church and, and at your churches throughout the land, Lord. Uh, your people are hungry for your word. And so open up our hearts and our minds uh, that we could receive it. Uh, and like we're saying, give us some teeth to chew on it, Lord. Make it nourishing um, to our spiritual growth. Um, let, us, let us become mature Christians, adult Christians, Lord, uh, more and more. As we hear more and more and see more and more of you, uh, let us welcome that into our lives and, and eagerly seek those times that, that those things happen, Lord. Um, now we pray your hand upon us and on all of the brothers and sisters who believe uh, both this week and throughout the rest of this month, Lord, that you would bless them uh, and that you would keep them and that you would make your face to shine upon them. Um, even if it makes us tremble in fear, Lord, uh, do not turn your face from us, Lord, but, but call us home. And until then, Lord, just give us strength and we pray for this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.